Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Matthew Levinson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. Matthew John Levison was born on December 12, 1986, and lived in Sydney, Australia. He went by the name Matt. He had two brothers, one older and one younger. In 2004, 17-year-old Matt used an online dating site and met a 41-year-old man named Michael Atkins. Michael was born in 1963 in South Australia. His father had difficulty regulating his intake of alcohol. Michael was badly mistreated by his father and lived in a constant state of fear. Michael had romantic relationships with women before dating men. As far as his career, he had worked as a security guard for several years before becoming an electrician. Matt and Michael communicated online for two years before agreeing to meet in person in 2006. At this point, Matt moved into Michael's apartment. As an electrician, Michael worked full-time installing machinery at various businesses around Sydney. Matt also had a full-time job. He worked in a call center. In addition to traditional employment, the couple had a business together on the side. They sold MDMA and GHB. At first, the couple sold these drugs to have a little extra money, but then it became quite profitable. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On Saturday, September 22, 2007, at about 10.30 p.m., the couple used Matt's car to drive to a nightclub called ARK. It's spelled A-R-Q. After this, they made their way to a friend's house, had a few drinks, and then returned to the nightclub. Just before 2 a.m., now on Sunday, September 23, Michael sent Matt a text message asking where he was and informed him that they needed to return to Matt's vehicle in order to obtain more GHB to sell. Michael and Matt left the club at about 2.20 a.m., but Michael returned about an hour later to sell drugs. Matt was not with him. Presumably, he was in the car waiting for Michael. One of Matt's friends sent him a text message. Matt replied at 3.20 a.m. saying, quote, Mike's having a cry. He's taking me home. He says I can't stay, unquote. 20-year-old Matt Levinson was never seen or heard from again. On Monday, September 24, at 7.48 a.m., Michael sent a text message to Matt asking how he was and wanting to know his location. At 11.41 a.m., Michael sent another text message asking Matt to give him a call. At 4.40 p.m., after working all day and buying a pair of running shoes in cash, Michael once again texted Matt, asking for a call. Michael also communicated with Matt's friends, trying to find out where he was. On Tuesday, September 25, Matt did not show up for work. He normally worked Tuesday through Saturday. His parents called Michael, who told them that he and Matt spent Sunday together at home, but then Matt left and he had not heard from him. Matt's parents called the police and reported him missing. When the police spoke to Michael, he told them that he and Matt went to the Ark nightclub together. Michael wanted to leave during the early morning hours of Sunday, but Matt did not. Ultimately, they went to the apartment together. The next morning, everything was fine. Michael fell asleep at about 8.30 p.m. on Sunday. At this time, he and Matt were on the couch watching television. Michael woke up at about 1 a.m. now on Monday. Matt was gone. Michael assumed that Matt left to meet friends at the Ark nightclub. On Thursday, September 27, the police found Matt's 1999 Toyota Corolla at a park in a suburb of Sydney called Sutherland. The car was near a public toilet. According to the police, this area of the park was frequented by gay men looking for sex. In the trunk of Matt's car, the police found a receipt for a store called Bunnings Warehouse. It was from the purchase of a mattock and tape 
made on Sunday at 12.20 p.m. This was the day that Matt went missing. A mattock is a hand tool used for digging. Michael's fingerprints were on the receipt, and he was captured on video surveillance at the store. He had purchased the items alone. A large stereo system that Matt had in his trunk was missing. It was later found in the garage of Michael's apartment, as if somebody had removed it to make room in the trunk. Michael was interviewed by the police. He denied purchasing the mattock, despite being captured on video. On August 5, 2008, Michael was charged with Matt's murder. He went to trial in September 2009. His interview with the police was not admissible because the police violated his rights by not telling him he was a suspect. On October 20, 2009, Michael was found not guilty of murder and not guilty of manslaughter. About seven years later, in October and November of 2016, Michael was compelled to testify at a coronial inquest. He was offered immunity in exchange for his testimony, although he was not given immunity from perjury. Michael testified that, as far as he was aware, Matt was alive and living in Thailand. Later, Michael admitted that he lied on the stand. He could have been arrested for perjury and faced 10 years in prison, but prosecutors offered him another deal. If he revealed the location of Matt's body, he would avoid prosecution for perjury. Michael took the deal. Here is the story that Michael Atkins supplied to investigators. During the early morning hours of Sunday, September 23, 2007, he and Matt came home from the ARC nightclub because Matt was under the effects of substances. Michael went to sleep on the couch, and Matt went into the bedroom. When Michael woke up at 9.30 a.m., he noticed that Matt was dead on the bedroom floor. Michael found a bottle of GHB in the kitchen and thought that Matt must have overdosed. He panicked because he thought he would be blamed for Matt's death. Michael did not want people to think badly of him. He went to Bunning's warehouse and purchased a mattock. Michael removed the stereo from the trunk of Matt's vehicle to make room for Matt's body, which he loaded into the trunk at around 10 or 11 p.m. Michael drove Matt's car to a park in a suburb of Sydney, dug a hole with the mattock, and buried Matt's body. As per the terms of his agreement, Michael assisted the police with the search and tried to direct them to where he thought he buried Matt's body, but his memory was a bit fuzzy. He also appeared to be afraid of the woods. He said to one officer, quote, It's really scary down here, unquote. I find it curious that it wasn't scary enough in the park to prevent Michael from burying his lover in an unmarked grave at night. After an extended search, Matt's body was found under a small tree on May 31, 2017. The coroner was unable to determine how Matt Levison died. Michael had earned his immunity. He moved on with his life and found new love interests. Now moving to my analysis. Many people, including Matt's parents, believe that Michael was responsible for Matt's death. This brings me to the question, was Michael actually guilty of murder despite his acquittal? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Michael was guilty. It's important to keep in mind that many of these factors were not available to the jury, which could explain their not guilty verdict. I will start with the inculpatory factors. Michael was described as controlling and possessive in his relationship with Matt, some of Matt's friends said that Michael was pressuring Matt into having threesomes with other young men. Evidently, Matt did participate in this activity, and the relationship with Michael was strained from that point on. There is the sense that Michael wanted more from the relationship and wanted to experiment with other lovers. Matt appeared to be unhappy in his relationship with Michael. The day before Matt disappeared, he told a coworker he was going to stand up to Michael. Matt talked about leaving Michael and moving to London to get a fresh start. He thought that Michael was smothering him. Perhaps Matt's sentiment was prophetic. A witness said that Michael pushed Matt at a family gathering about three weeks before Matt's disappearance. Another witness saw Michael punch Matt in the arm in Michael's apartment. According to Michael's story, the reason he took Matt home early from the ARC nightclub was due to Matt's substance use. Matt was supposedly 
falling asleep in the nightclub. A witness in the nightclub contradicted this account by suggesting that Matt was not drowsy and not falling asleep. Based on Matt's text message, it appears as though he left the nightclub early because of an argument that he was having with Michael. Michael told many lies to the police during the interview, which was inadmissible at his trial. For example, he lied about returning to the nightclub to sell drugs and about purchasing the mattock. Michael also lied to Matt's parents. He admitted to them that he bought the mattock, but he lied about why he needed it. He claimed that he was going to use it to grow zucchinis in a garden, but there was no garden. Michael made an effort to conceal his involvement in the disposal of Matt's body. For example, Michael purchased a new pair of running shoes to replace the shoes he was wearing when he buried the body, and he sent text messages to Matt's phone when he knew that Matt was dead. Before disposing of Matt's body, Michael searched the internet looking for casual sexual encounters with men. It seems as though Michael moved on pretty quickly. Michael had studied martial arts and had even run a martial arts school in the 1990s. He was more than capable of strangling or otherwise killing Matt. Usually when a person disposes of a body in the woods, it is because they are trying to hide their involvement in a serious crime. Most people who stumble upon a dead body don't think to themselves, should I call for help or bury this body in the woods? It's such a tough decision. Michael claimed that he panicked after discovering Matt dead, but he disposed of Matt's body in a meticulous and methodical manner. He didn't even leave any DNA in the trunk of Matt's car, even though Matt's body was definitely transported in the trunk. This makes it seem like Michael lacked empathy and was self-centered. Moving to the exculpatory factors, on the night that Matt disappeared, one witness described him as being out of sorts and was certain that Matt had been taking drugs. This is consistent with Michael's story. Matt's cause of death was never determined. He used drugs and could have overdosed on GHB. It is a particularly dangerous drug as far as overdose deaths. It's possible that he was not murdered by anyone. There were no witnesses to Matt's death, no video. There was no evidence of a struggle in Michael's apartment or in Matt's vehicle. There was no evidence in this case that contradicted Michael's account. He could have been telling the truth, which would be something different from his normal behavior. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Michael Atkins was responsible for Matt's death? Yes, I believe he was. I am convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he was actually guilty. There is not much reason to believe that Matt would have suddenly died from substance use at the age of 20. He had used the substances before and not died. What was unique about this particular night? It stands to reason that someone killed him, and the most obvious culprit would be Michael. He disposed of Matt's body, repeatedly lied, and quickly moved on as far as romance. If I was only working with what the jury had available during Michael's trial, I would say that Michael was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The case presented before the jury was very different than what is available now. The jury knew that Matt was missing and that Michael had purchased a mattock, but they did not know about Michael's initial statement to the police where he lied repeatedly, and they did not know for sure that Matt was dead. The defense called 11 witnesses who testified about possible sightings of Matt. In addition, there was no evidence that Matt's body was in the trunk of his vehicle. And Matt lost contact with his parents in August of 2006 when he moved in with Michael. They reported him missing. Matt wasn't actually missing at the time, but it still makes it seem as though he was the type of person who might simply take off and lose contact with his family. Maybe he did that again. I think the jury made the right decision based on the evidence. The prosecution should not have brought this case to trial. They squandered their one chance to convict Michael. They will never get another chance again. Those are my thoughts in the case of Matthew Levison. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.